how important this day of atonement is in God's plan. We see on this fifth step in God's perfect plan what is needed and what our part is. This afternoon and morning, as it's going to go into both, I think, I would like to look at four reasons for the Day of Atonement. Each year, there's nothing new in the messages we go through and remind us of these days. And as I often mention, there's so much to each of these points as a sermon in themselves. And even as I was reviewing again this morning, I was like, I've got too many verses in here. We'll see what we have. But they're fun verses to go through, review. But we see these four reasons for the Day of Atonement. Why does God give us this day? What are we to remember every single year? What are we to take from it? We see the very first one, it's usually the most common sense, but it's also one that I've seen neglected, that people through time will forget and think, well, these are just customs. These are just Jewish days. These aren't really what they are. First reason for the Day of Atonement is to remind us God instructs us to be here. God instructs us to be here. It is not out of the goodness of our heart that we just decide to show up here on a Monday. It's not our decision. Turn over to Leviticus 23. <clears throat> we reviewed some of this day already a few weeks ago with all the fall festivals. Leviticus chapter 23, if you look at these verses, verses 26 through 32, there is a lot in this section for atonement, maybe more than any of the other festivals in this chapter, uh, that gives a lot of direction. You see of Leviticus 23, we've looked earlier, but the reminder in verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. Holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Holy convocations, the feasts of the Lord. These are not our days, they're not the United Church of God's days. They're not any man's days. These are the feasts of the Lord. And they are to be proclaimed at their appointed time. You see, dropping down to verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month, shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. The appointed day that God gives us reminds us in this seventh month, on this tenth day of the month, the first day of the month was trumpets, and we have this reminder of what this day of atonement is on the tenth day, at God's appointed time. This time period that we see here continues in verse 28, and you shall do no work on that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God, who we are atoned with, as again we heard in the sermonette. For any person who is not afflicted of soul on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. Usually it's not an argument when you're fasting. You think, oh, really? I was wanting to work today. Even to set up, it gets a little more tiring when you're on an empty stomach. But this reminder over and over not to do any work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening, last night at sundown, from evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. I always love how chapter 23 we see over and over at least 12 times it mentions they're God's feasts, but they're also to be ours. We know who's the owner of these feast days, and really, as you look at chapter 23, whenever I go through it, there's at least 29 references to who it belongs to, whose references, 12 specifically, that say they're the feast of the Lord. But it also comes back that you shall celebrate your Sabbath. It's to be ours. So we looked at two days ago. To we're walking humbly with our God to know they're His days and to remember what 
we celebrate. We are to celebrate today. We see a difference in the celebration maybe than we think of during the Feast of Tabernacles, but this reminder of why we're here, what does this day represent, may be the biggest day of celebration when you think of what will take place. This section in, verse, in verses 26 through 32, multiple times we see the Day of Atonement. You hear it in the world, Yom Kippur. You speak Hebrew, nothing wrong with saying it. It's just the same thing that we say, Day of Atonement. Yom means day. Uh, Kippur means atonement. Uh, this word for atonement, Kippurim. This word that we see here is Strong's number 37. 25, close to the one we looked at in the sermonette, the verb. Here's the noun, this atonement, the act of reconciliation to God. So we see what these verses are pointing us to. This day of reconciliation could also be called this day of reconciling to God. To remember why we're here. And we see at least three times in these verses, verses 27, 29, and 32, uh, that mentioned to afflict our souls. The word fast is not specifically used in this section, but we see that that's what it is referring to, as we'll see here. But this word afflict, I always love the Hebrew word every time I look at it, it makes me chuckle. Uh, the Hebrew word is anah. Kind of want to gnaw on something today? Anah? Anah? I don't know. Maybe it has nothing to do. It's my brain, sorry. Uh, Strong's number 6031. <clears throat> And it means to be humbled, to fast. Other definitions have in the same one. Ezra chapter 8, you can hold your place here. We'll be back close to this mark if it helps you. The same word, ana, afflict. Same word we see in Ezra chapter 8. Ezra 8. I think we looked at this in the summer as we were looking at all that Ezra had been doing. And here he's getting ready to return as the king and the logical thing, you're bringing all this money. I mean, it, talk about the money they were bringing back to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. And it was like, all right, do we ask for an escort? Do we ask for you know them to bring soldiers to guard us? Or do we go to God who will protect us? Logically, in the human mind, you're like, of course we've got to have soldiers with us. But they don't take it into their own hands. They say, all right, let's take it to God. What does he want us to do? Here, see Ezra chapter 8 and verse 21. Ezra talking here, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahaza that we might humble ourselves before our God. Where we see the same word, humble ourselves, ana, to afflict ourselves uh, with a fast. Before our God, to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. This attitude of fasting and humbling ourselves has to have the attitude of seeking what does God want from me? You think of our lives and never think, well, I'm good to go. I looked at two days ago, that attitude of humility of uh, where am I going wrong in my life? Are there things that I need to work on? What, what Am I in line with God's ways? Am I at one with him? And that reflection as we humble ourselves with fasting, seeking God's will in our life always a lot to this word, a lot to what God instructs us on this day to afflict our souls. This fasting that takes place, that again, as we looked at two days ago, it's more than just doing without food and water. It's an attitude that God is looking for, one of drawing close to him. We see as well over in Acts, I love going to Acts, because sometimes I've seen people, well, you know, this really isn't fasting, uh, in Leviticus, well, it is, because we see even Paul will mention it, <clears throat> Acts chapter 27 and verse 9, 
Acts 27 and verse 9, when this day is mentioned, you can say, oh, atonement is never mentioned in the New Testament. Well, it is, but it's interesting the way Paul addresses it. Now, verse 9 of Acts 27, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast, even capital F, this is not just a a self-proclaimed fast, uh, because the fast was already over. Paul telling them then, oh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be sailing. It wasn't the best of time in that year, time of year. You, you think of hurricanes and other things that were be usually around that time of year. But this fast, that you look up in the commentaries, they all say this is the Day of Atonement. When that fast, capital F, took place. Where God commands the fast. Other places that we looked at even a couple days ago, and I was going through and digging into a more Zechariah 7 verse 5 that I mentioned, uh, which could mention the Day of Atonement. I don't know how adamant I was in both sermons. I gave that message twice, but it mentions the fast in the fifth of the month and the seventh. And I said, well, it could mention atonement, but that fifth and seventh, you see later, we may go through this after the feast uh, to make sure we're clear on this. Uh, Zechariah 8 verse 19 mentions the fast of the fourth of the month, the fifth, the seventh of the month, and the tenth month. Tenth month, not the day of the month. Each month. But each of these dealt with a mourning period in Israel when captivity took place. Uh, Someone got killed. uh, They would besiege Jerusalem. And their memory of those months were events that took place. And the one that we'll look at, that I mentioned, well, that seventh of the month could mention atonement, but more likely it mentions when there was a captivity that took place. If you want to dig into it, I will hopefully look at it after the feast, uh, if all goes well. But that mention, again, of those fasts that we can proclaim are little f's. This capital F is the one God proclaims to afflict our souls. Uh, why is last night is probably maybe the most careful you are with planning your meal? You know, we are in our house. All right, we're, we're not pushing it off. Even on the Sabbath, there's time. Oh, we can start it after sunset. You know, we got to eat before sunset. And what time is sunset? And what time are we going to be done with the meal? And what? You're, okay, let's make sure this is precise. This is, oh, it's close enough. No, it's the flicting that God commands. God, again, instructs us to be here to afflict our souls to again come before him and draw close to him. Nowhere do we see God's instructions removed. No place that says, oh yeah, Christ comes, oh no, I'll I'll fast 40 days, 40 nights. That way you don't have to do it anymore. He gives us the example of, oh, we need to keep drawing close to God. We see even more to atonement as we do with all of God's festivals in the New Testament see some of that. But this first important point that I never want us to take for granted, God instructs us to be here. God instructs us to be here. Second of all, the second reason for the Day of Atonement, it reminds us of our perfect high priest. It reminds us of our perfect high priest. Turn back to Leviticus. Sometimes Leviticus 16 is one that we just will look at on this day or near this day. Gone through a sermon or two a year or two ago. We went through this section almost entirely through the sermon. I'm not going to go through this like I did then. You can always pull out those sermons or dig into this the rest of the day to look at this attitude that was here, but also as we'll read more in the heat in the New Testament of, oh, wow, it really brings these verses to light. Leviticus 16 and verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, this is Nadab and Abihu from Leviticus chapter 10, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. Here we see this offering of profane fire. It's not what God commanded wasn't on the day that he proclaimed. wasn't how he instructed. That never happens now. Oh, let's worship December 25th, and let's say Christ was born on it. Most people today even realize he wasn't born. It never was. 
It's the Saturnalia festival from paganism. But we will put God's name on it and offer profane fire. No difference. You look at even in this country, you see even a couple days ago that we'll, we'll bring the America back and repent. And this big hoopla in D.C. and we're going to bring everyone. Well, what are you going to repent of? The individuals calling this fast or this prayer and trying to bring everyone to repent in the country were people who keep Sunday, Christmas, Easter. Great. Let's start with those. Oh, no, you don't need to repent of those. What are you repenting of then? How about you look at God's laws and repent of those? Let's start with that. Some of these repentance things that goes on in this world, it's just for show. Oh, I got this book. Again, Jonathan Kahn, I think, is another one who's got another book out. Well, great. Guess what? It's not free. Let's get another sale going. Let's make some money off of this. And we'll say repent, make you feel good, but you don't really need to repent because we're going to be keeping Christmas and Easter this year just like we did every other year. Those are the things you repent of. Quit offering profane fire. The nation needs to repent, but it needs to go to God's laws, not to the Billy Grahams of the world and all these individuals who aren't following God to begin with. We think of these profane fire, it's nothing new. Nadab and Abihu did it in Leviticus 10. We see this reminder here, verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at simply any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. Two sons died. Doesn't hold anyone able to just go in whenever they wanted. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of the young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. Shall put on the linen. He goes through his instructions of what he was to wear to be washed, be clean going in. Because this was the holy of holies. He was going in to the temple area. How precious. This wasn't just, yeah, throw on whatever you think. Another attitude in this world. You know, you come before God anyway. Short t-shirt, God doesn't care. You're coming before the ruler of the universe. Do you think what you're coming before him with? With attitude and with that humility and with what you wear before this dignitary who is before all dignitaries on this world and in the universe. Aaron had very specific things on what he was to do. We seek of these things mentioned as it continues in verse 5. <clears throat> and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. We see the ram that was for Aaron and his household Verse 6, for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the Azazel. Many of you probably have scapegoat gone through this, I think, every year. It's a terrible translation. Everything that Satan receives is exactly what he deserves. He is not a scapegoat, what we look at in our terminology of this world. Well, he's just the one who gets blamed for it. Everything that goes on the head of the Azazel is exactly what should go there. And we'll see that throughout the New Testament as well. We think of verse 9, And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell, and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the Azazel into the wilderness. The rest of this chapter goes through the detail. Ultimately, three sacrifices. The ram was for Aaron and his household, verses 11 through 14. The end of verse 14, I love how certain symbolism we're going to see in Hebrew. 
We see as it ends, and before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. The sprinkling of the blood. You see, that goes back to that symbolism of Christ's sacrifice. We think of this ram that was sacrificed for Aaron and his household. And then we see, as then it goes into verse 15 through verse 19, the sin offering, the goat that represents Jesus Christ. It's very hard to see the difference between the two, why it has to come before God for the lot to be chosen, which is which, both identical looking. And as we think of in this world, I'm not trying to badmouth people that call themselves Christian. We see this reminder. If you call yourself Christian, you have to do what Christ said. It isn't, I'll do what I want to do. I'll keep Christmas. I'll keep Easter. I'll do whatever I want. That is not a Christian. It can be someone who's trying to do what they think, but a Christian tries to follow Christ. And I don't say it to me, oh boy, that puffs us. Oh yeah, we, are we doing it? Are we following Christ every bit in our life? There's times where, well, yeah, maybe here I'm not. I need to be in line. The title is not something of arrogance. It's not, well, we are this and they are not. No, we hope all repent and have that title of being Christian and following. But it should upset us when people use the term, oh, I'm a Christian. Okay, great. Well, so you keep God's laws. Oh, no, no, I don't keep God's laws. Then you're not a Christian by the definition in the Bible. And it's not to be little. It's to, all right, am I doing it? This attitude of humility is we all want to be, again, doing justly. To love mercy. To love when someone repents. I would love if at D.C. that they had people that would, oh, we need to be keeping Sabbath. Atonement is on Monday? Well, we need to be keeping atonement. How many of them that were doing their march think they were actually doing it? I hope so. Was there repentance? It's more than just a word to throw around. This attitude that is to be a part of us, as we see especially on this day in that reminder of this sin offering, the goat that the lot fell for the Lord, and this sin offering that goes back to Christ's sacrifice to remind us of his sacrifice, why we can stand before God every day of our life. Because we have a high priest in heaven who is there for us that we can come before the Father. Do we really think about, wow, how special that is? Because this day back in Leviticus 16 that reminds them, they could only go into the, the high place once a year. And so why it was a big deal, what they went through in this reminder of how special this is. This atonement that took place in this sin offering, verses 15 through 19, and how the sin offering also ends in verse 19. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it and sanctify it for the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. To forgive, to picture that forgiveness of sin, this sacrifice of this goat did not forgive the people's sins. It pictured the coming sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the perfect sacrifice that would forgive our sins when we repent. Not when we throw around the word, I repent, but when we actually repent in our lives. And then we see in verse 20 <clears throat> through most of the rest of this chapter, it goes up to verse 26, this Azazel goat. This word Azazel that we see earlier in verse 8 and sprinkled through this chapter, this word for Azazel means the goat of departure, entire removal. This entire removal of sin and guilt from the sacred places into the desert on the back of this Azazel goat, symbolic of entire forgiveness. Christ's sacrifice forgives our sins, but there is still someone out there who's responsible for what his part has been and continues to be. 
And he's not to be forgotten what that part is. This world loves to forget about Satan. You know, why is God allowing the hurricanes and God's doing all the things that are going on? People don't want God in their life. They're not trying to follow, repent, and follow God. So God's, if you don't want me, I can step back and you can just have Satan's world. And these are the things Satan wants to kill every single one of us on this planet. He has no care for anyone. We look at what Satan's objective has always been. And we look at what his responsible part is of this is. This is also goat, as we see, symbolizing Satan. Satan is responsible for his part. I'm going to go through the whole list, but you just start looking at the lies, deceit, deception, evil, wickedness that he does and proclaims and calls evil good and good evil. Satan has his responsibility for those sins that he continues to promote. And that is also a goat that gets cast out into the wilderness. We see as it continues then here in verse 20. And when he had made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities in an uninhibited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garments which he put on, and he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body which with water in a holy place, put on his garments, come out and offer his burnt offerings and the burnt offerings of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people. Verse 26, And he who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterwards he may come into the camp. This scapegoat, this azazel is the proper translation is uh, this goat of departure this entire removal what we see Satan's part in and what we'll see throughout more of the New Testament but this sacrifice of the sin offering for Aaron and the sin offering for all the people and that it was only done once a year Verse 29, this shall be a statute forever for you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month. You shall afflict your souls and do no work on it, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who sojourns among you. And on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. We heard in the sermonette, verse 34, This shall be an everlasting statute for you, to make atonement for the children of Israel, for all their sins once a year. This reminder of once a year that was done on atonement, because people had profaned going in. Nadab and Abihu and the earlier part of this are mentioned, those that would treat it like any other day didn't do it on the appointed day, didn't do it as God had shown. This reminder that you look through all the high priests that have ever lived, not a single one was ever perfect. And you see some who made big mistakes, major mistakes. You see Christ come in and overturn the tables. Ultimately, whose responsibility was it that they weren't ripping people off and treating God's house like a den of thieves? It should have been the high priest. The high priest should have come in and, wait, what are you doing? We can't be stealing from God's people. This is a holy place. This is where God's name is. This is what the sacrifice is. Ultimately, the high priest should have known better. We think of what Christ was so upset about. God's holy place was being desecrated. 
It was being treated irreverently. This day of atonement that are reminded that the, holy, the high priest was only allowed to come in once a year and how special it was, how very specific the details are through this whole chapter. But where, again, this is the old covenant, how it was kept, but it shows how it is done now. What was the meaning? God doesn't, oh, yeah, let's toss a coin. How many goats should we have? Oh, yeah, why not? It was very precise because it would picture something in the future. We see two specific things that were very unusual for atonement that wasn't like the other festivals. First of all, the high priest entered the most holy place. None of the other festivals did the high priest enter the most holy place. It was only once a year. They even got so specific, and I don't know, maybe I could partly understand. They would actually wrap a, a, a tie a, a rope around the priest's leg just in case he has a heart attack or he does something wrong and they could drag him out because otherwise you can't go back in until the next year. I'm like, did that ever happen? I mean, but you think about how specific it was. Once a year, that was it. I still do find it kind of humorous, the guy walking in with the rope on his leg. How about you just do it exactly as God says, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, God didn't give anyone a heart attack as they walked in, but those that profaned, they would be killed. And why these instructions were there. You see, high priests of that were human and their offspring, they didn't have the best record. You even look at Aaron uh, giving the excuse of the golden calf. Oh, I just threw the gold in, and out came this calf. Really? That sounds like a two-year-old's explanation of why your hand was caught in the cookie jar. I'm like, really? That's the best attempt you got? We think even Moses being furious at times, his temper getting the better of him. You think of other examples that you see. Why is it so per so important that we remember about the high priest today. We can be very thankful we don't have a human high priest anymore. We think of the high priest who went in for the sins once a year for all. Makes you think, why does this world not like to think about atonement? Well, probably they don't want to fast, first of all. But also, who cares about the law? The law is done away with. If the law is done away with, why do you need to worry about sin? We think of this attitude that's there. <clears throat> sin has to be dealt with. And what this reminder is. I think I got sidetracked. I said those two things unusual for atonement. I mentioned the first one. The second one, one goat was ceremonially led into the wilderness, not killed. Sorry for those anticipating that second one. <clears throat> but again, all the sins once a year, the law is not done away with. We still have to repent of those sins. Turn back to Isaiah 59, how important it is to remember what happens when we let sin in our life, when we don't repent of it. Isaiah chapter 59 <clears throat> Isaiah 59. You think of our sins. What happens when we don't repent of our sins? Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. So you think the point is repent. He's there listening. He's ready for the repentance. Verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he, he, he will not hear. For your hands have defiled your blood, and your fingers with iniquity. I'm sorry, your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue has muttered perversity. 
this attitude of, I will follow God how I want to follow. It's one we see all around this world. People thinking they're spiritual, thinking they'll have all the answers. Instead of the humility of, well, what does God say I should do? It takes tremendous humility. But that unrepented sin separates us from God. Why the sin has to be forgiven. Why it's not to be, well, the law is done away with. I don't have to repent of anything. Is something this world tries to teach, but it's nowhere in the scripture. This day of atonement reminds us of our perfect high priest. And the reminder that our sins have to be forgiven. The importance of being at one with God. Turn over to John chapter 8. This is another one that I've seen people quote in the world especially. If, you know, the, the woman caught in adultery and Christ doesn't condemn her. What does he tell her though? You know, this was all trying to trick him. Every time I read through it, I'm like, where's the guy? They bring the woman. We caught her in adultery. She didn't do it by herself. Where's the guy? He's not there. So this accusation trying to get him to uh, kill this woman, stone her, which would have been against the, the man-made laws. Well, see, now Christ just doesn't want to deal with law anymore. He's given us free reign. Not at all what is mentioned through this story. As he tells him in verse 7, John 8, verse 7, when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. It's interesting that Christ doesn't say, where's the guy? There was all kinds of faults in their argument. He doesn't say, where's the guy? Why is this not being done? Why is this being out? He's like, how many of you are looking at yourself? Makes you wonder if he knew all, we you know he knew everything about them. And it's always the mystery, what did he write? It was something enough that each one of them, from the oldest to the youngest, left. They weren't looking at themselves, these scribes and Pharisees, the same ones that he mentions in Matthew 23, of hypocrites. They'll bring in someone to accuse them, but they didn't go by the full law to begin with. It's interesting when he looks up, <clears throat> verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. From now on, go and sin no more. Christ is, does not say, you're, you're off the hook. Go back to what you were doing. He's like, Stop sinning. Stop going down that path. Repent. We don't see her repent anywhere in here. There's no mention of it. Christ didn't witness what took place. The ones who witnessed it, if they actually did, ran off after he rode in the ground. The emphasis that we see from Christ that is to all of us, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Don't let sin reign in your life. Stop doing what's wrong. Verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This reminder Christ had was, we're to walk in light. We're not to walk in sin. We're to repent of our sins, to look to God in our life always. This importance of reminding us that sin separates us from God, where Christ tells her, go and sin no more. Stop. This reminder that we have of our perfect high priest. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. It will be hard to stop in parts of this in Hebrews because I was reading through more of it last night and I was, oh, what about this verse? What about this verse? There goes those verses. <laughs> Hebrews 
chapter 6, especially in light of what we read in Leviticus 16, gives us the perfect backdrop to remind us of our perfect high priest. Hebrews chapter 6, begin in verse 19. We read through part of this a few weeks ago. Verse 19 of Hebrews 6, This hope we have as an anchor of of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Or translations, the likeness of Melchizedek. We think of Jesus Christ became the high priest forever. If that doesn't excite us enough about today, what will? We think about individuals, everyone in this room, me included. We're not perfect. We're all working on it. We're trying to overcome. We have the perfect high priest. We never have to worry, well, Christ, he, he may slip up here or there. He's perfect. You think about the instruction when we get to the kingdom of God and, well, you know, I want to hear it from Christ. You hear the exact instruction. You don't, well, I don't know. Is the Father going to agree with what he wants me to do? You talk about all through his life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John showing, here's what the Father has me to give. Here's what God's, God's instruction is for you. Here's what the Father gave. You can never have a more perfect high priest. And he's in that position forever. How we are so thankful for that. We see more of the instruction through this section in chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High. It's important. You look at Melchizedek. It's Jesus Christ. We see in verse 3, he's without father, without mother. I've never met anyone without father and mother. Um, We all have them. Melchizedek was Jesus Christ, the Word, at that point. Uh, Without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Reminder that goes back to Melchizedek. We won't go back through Melchizedek in Genesis. But as it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High. You can't be the Most High and the priest of the Most High. You have the Word who was Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High. And you have who we have now, the Father, the Most High. This reminder of our High Priest as it goes through this section, dropping down to verse 11, <clears throat> Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, well, see, the law is the bad part. If we got rid of the law, it's not what's mentioned. We think of this law. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Oh, here we go. We're changing the law again. What's the change? You can stop there, or you can keep reading, and then you see what the change is. Verse 13, For he, Jesus Christ, of whom these things are spoken, belongs to another tribe. Here is a difference. Christ did not come from the tribe of Levi. Levitical priesthood, you had to be in the tribe of Levi. Where did Christ come from? Verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. The kingly line, very fitting, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Jesus Christ, the first of the first fruits, the first to be resurrected into God's family. Not God, the Son of God. He is our high priest. You think of how important these verses remind us. 
verse 17, for he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. People in the world love, see, the commandments are weak and unprofitable. Is that what's being referred to? Because if you do want to go down that path, as I joke about all the time, then you can kill people. Oh, well, not that commandment. That one's fine. Okay, so I can lie. No, you should tell the truth so I can sleep around behind my wife's bed. Oh, no, no, you need to be faithful. Okay, so the Sabbath. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. We don't. We can do whatever we want. Okay, so one commandment. It's not what it's saying here. The annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, profitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. Here it gets to, again, the reason. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope which, uh, through which we draw near to God. You think about this wording that's used, it's weak and unprofitableness. You think about the, the killing of the sheep. It never forgave sins. It pointed to who would forgive sins the perfect lamb of God. It was never intended. It was always meant to point to that perfect sacrifice. Those traditions, those things, that religious laws that were enacted back then, that were to point to the more perfect. This reminder of what would take place, and here as we see through these verses earlier, this priesthood line that would now no longer be Levitical was no longer through the tribe of Levi, but came through Jesus Christ through the tribe of Judah. A change, a perfect change. Not doing away with the God's laws, but showing in more fullness what the intent was always meant to be. We see the greatness of this high priest throughout these verses. It's where it gets difficult, I'm trying to jump through some of these, but they're so wonderful in their meaning. Verse 20, And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, here's the oath that goes back to Psalm 110, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For by, so, for by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. A better guarantee is surety. has become a guarantee of a better covenant. And there are many priests because they, have, they were prevented by death from continuing. Think about the weakness of a human high priest. Even if you have someone wonderful. Eventually they die and they get replaced and well, what are you going to get with the next one? Verse 24, and he still talking of Christ because he continues forever has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless. This word harmless means innocent. Think of Jesus Christ as that perfect high priest. Innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests who offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath which came from the law, Psalm 110 again, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Why the perfect high priest? There's no longer a need for the ram that was always needed. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was once for all to forgive all sins. To remind us of this perfect high priest who brings in the better promise. 
that you repent and turn to Christ through to God through his sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your sins can be forgiven. Not, well, this just symbolizes when they can be forgiven, when it will take place, that our sins can be removed as far as east is from west. Through his sacrifice, and that reminder is he comes before God on a daily basis, not once a year on our behalf. We think of this importance of that perfect high priest. We see in the chapter 8, verse 1, now this is the main point of the thing we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. And every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, capital O, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. The temple was still there at this point when this was written. Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Think of all the things, the temple, the, the sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant were specific models for what was in heaven that were very specific. This is why it's precise. You're, you're just making a copy of the example of what is in heaven, in God's throne room. And these examples, the pattern, verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Well, and the better promises have to be God's laws done away with. The better promises are eternal life. You think about God's law being written on your heart. We see in verses 7 through 13, those reminders. This reminder of our perfect high priest who is also our mediator. Something that we are reminded of through this day. We see in the chapter 9, for sake of time, there's so much in here, it's hard to skip over sections, but good Good ones to read through later if you have the time. Chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself when the people's sins committed to in ignorance, the Holy Spirit indicating this that way, into the holiest of holies, all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices were are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. It didn't forgive his sins. It was symbolic. You see in verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not the copies, the, the man made, we made those examples of what are in heaven, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, it sanctifies, still didn't forgive, pictured it, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without 
spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Some of these verses that we've read through, you you can go, well, what does that mean? You just keep reading and it explains it perfectly. You start looking again at our perfect high priest. These examples that are mentioned, continuing, dropping down to verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, the representations, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, he doesn't have to keep having the sacrifice, it was once for all, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. White, great, great white throne judgment mentioned. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart for, from sin for salvation. The seventh trump. We think of these verses that again remind us of what we have and who we have as our perfect high priest. Chapter 10 goes through the animal sacrifices and why they weren't sufficient. We've mentioned already verse 4 of chapter 10, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. That's why it was never perfect. It was going through the process, but it was always pointing to the perfect sacrifice. We think of these reminders through this of Jesus Christ's ultimate sacrifice. That first goat in Leviticus 16 that pictures that perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ shows through all the sacrifices that took place. Sometimes we wonder, why is all those things listed? See Leviticus 4 through 7. It goes through all the sacrifices. Look at all the things that were very specific. It wasn't all that's not that important. They were very specific. Why is, again, you think of Passover. Why did it have to be a lamb without any blemishes? Just get the sickly one. Then we can keep the other ones. We can eat them through the year. Because it represented Christ. The perfect sacrifice. And why do the people who really understood, they would go through and they'd have it through those four to six days. I think it was four days when they would examine the lamb. And they'd be looking at, oh, yeah, there's a blemish there. Let's get another one. They were to know what it was to symbolize and how important it was. The sacrifices picture that the penalty of sin is death. Animal death cannot pay a human penalty. The sacrifices were only foreshadows picturing Christ's perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ paid the penalty of human sin by his unjust death. Reminded of that, especially every year before Passover, but also to be reminded of it this day as well. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> There's more under the second point, so 3 and 4 will go quickly. I know where atonement can be a tougher time for lengthier sermons. So Hebrews chapter 2. A fun study, I love chapter 1, 2, and 3. I have a, a mark, a, one color for the Father, one color for the Son. And it's neat how much it goes back and forth. Sometimes you can read it and just see the he's and him's, and, well, that has to be Christ. But when you read the full context, oh, well, that, that's the Father, it looks like. And here, it's, it's a fun study. And so you see in the chapter 3, <clears throat> I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 17, 
Therefore in all things he made it, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. As we looked at two days ago, the weightier matter of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. Christ is perfect in all areas. Not that it should surprise us. He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, this word is also reconciliation, to make atonement, to make atonement for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to aid those who are tempted. Therefore, chapter 3, verse 1, Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, capital A. Sometimes we don't think about Jesus Christ, the apostle. You think he's the apostle of God. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him, faithful to the Father, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Think of our perfect example and our perfect high priest. Why, hopefully you can see how it's hard to stop in these, they just keep going and how just beautiful it points to Jesus Christ is our perfect high priest. The example that we have, especially on this day of atonement. Leads us to the third of these four reasons for atonement. The second one reminds us of our perfect high priest. Thirdly, sometimes we can skip right to this one. It's important, but it's not the sole meaning of this day. We are reminded of Satan's future. We are reminded of Satan's future. So we think again back to Leviticus 16, verses 7 through 10. The azazel, the goat of departure, the entire removal. This does not represent Jesus Christ resurrected. Many of you use that. We've gone through a couple sermons a year or two ago into that topic. Uh, good ones to pull up. They're good reminders of why God gives us every year to, again, dig into the scriptures. What does it mean? Turn back to John chapter 12. We are reminded of Satan's future. John chapter 12. Yes, I would just look for water. <laughs> Sorry, now it's on your mind. I should have just kept my mouth shut. John chapter 12, verse 28. John 12. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? This is Jesus Christ talking, talking to the Father. Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Every time I read Christ, it just he continually points to the Father. Anyone who thinks that Christ points to themselves does not read the Bible. You go through these verses, he's constantly... Your glory. Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Already pointing to his resurrection. And people are wondering, well, where did this voice come from? I love verse 30. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me. Christ didn't need to hear his voice. This voice didn't come because of me. Uh, but for your sake, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. 
We think of the ruler of this world, Satan the devil. He rules this world. Why it is so often forgot? Why do we have so much heartache in this world? Because it is Satan's world, and this is how he rules it. He's happy to see people go through cancer and die. He's happy to see people suffer any which way he can possibly make it happen. This is Satan's world, and he will be cast out. Through Christ, Satan can be overcome. Let's turn over to Revelation 20. I don't think I've ever gone through a atonement message without reading this because I love these verses. <clears throat> and I am excited to see this take place. This casting of that Azazel goat out into the wilderness. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon. Very similar wording, even the way the Subal man in Leviticus lays hold of that goat. If you've ever had a goat, you know, sometimes you can have kind of a pet goat. I always think of our neighbor back in Illinois. He had this goat that was always in Beth's flower garden. It was always out there. I just, I was ready to just, I mean, uh, walk it peacefully back over to the yard. I don't, it was a master of escape. It constantly was getting out. And I still remember one day I had enough. I think I was working on something outside and it was, I turned around, it's right there again. I'm like, I grabbed that thing by the horns and I'm just, he's just leaping and I'm like, whoa, I mean, like, you take that rope and now you, you put it around gently, but gently enough that you're hoping it will stay. You think of that analogy from Leviticus 16. He laid hold on the dragon. This is not just, oh, would you please come here? Uh, let's, let's go ahead. You picture this. There's going to be resisting. It's not going to work. He's going to lay hold of this dragon, that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Think of what Satan deserves and what will take place. I think if I read this verse 2, I try to make mention of this. There is a section that is left out, which does give it even more meaning. Some scribe left it out, and I wouldn't want to be whoever this scribe was. Verse 2, the original Greek, he laid hold of the dragon, that servant of old, who is the devil and Satan, should be added in here, the one deceiving the whole inhabited earth and bound him for a thousand years. Not too surprising, Satan got that removed by some scribe who probably wasn't a Christian to begin with. But we see this one who deceived the whole inhabited earth. A few of these words that are mentioned here, this word dragon. He laid hold of the dragon means huge serpent. The Greeks called the dragon a species of serpent because he could see so well. Serpent in the Garden of Eden, deceived and lied. This great dragon. Uh, we see other places that laid hold of the dragon. We see who is the devil and Satan. This word for devil means accuser, one opposed to us. Enemy of any kind, he is your enemy. This word for Satan means very similar, adversary, enemy. We see a lot of descriptive words about this being who gets thrown into that bottomless pit. We see him being thrown in, shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. We often go through and we mention verse 7 through 10 where he'll be released after that millennial reign. Um, I don't have the exact reason. We know God does and he's perfect in his plan. Maybe it's to see how much that deception is there. Look at his deception, how quickly it takes place. 
and how quickly the reminder may be to the faithful who may be shaking in their boots a little bit at that point of what's going to happen. Here he's got this huge multitude coming up against Jerusalem. And God's like, I'm here for you, but you've got to put your trust in me. We see this deception that will be allowed to be released for a short while. And I pray that short while is just that short. But we know God is perfect in his plan, and we don't have to wonder why. We know there's a perfect reason. This dragon, devil, and Satan is all these descriptive words. Never underestimate Satan and his deceptions. So I go back to Leviticus 16, the two goats. God has to show which is which. And why is I don't try to mock at all people who try or think they call themselves Christian. It can look so close to the real thing. I pray to the same being. Well, do you? Or is it a three-headed being? Is it the Trinity? Because the Trinity is not in the Bible. It's not popular. Even churches of God have gone to the Trinity. Because how quickly they want to be accepted by the religions of this world. The religions of this world that are deceived by Satan. This deception of Satan should never be taken lightly. Turn back to Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12. Last point of this point three. Revelation 12 and verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Try to emphasize this each time. It does not say who deceives the whole world except for those in God's church. Deceptions take place. Why I'm always mentioning sermons. Can you dig into the scripture? Do you know? I even heard not too long ago, someone, oh, you know, it's okay. You, you don't have to go to the feast. It's not that. Wherever two or three are gathered in God's name, that's where he'll put his, uh, God is always there. It's an easy one to disprove. That's not what the context of the verse is. Matthew 18, somewhere in there. We're not turning there for the sake of time. How quickly you can, oh, yeah, wherever two or three are gathered together, God's there. That's not what the verse is saying. He's not saying, otherwise, why go keep the feast? Oh, just find two or three other people, and then you can keep the feast all by yourself. You can decide what's right or wrong. Again, there are reasons. People with health difficulties can't go up. There's, but this deciding, oh, I can decide where I keep the feast. No, you can't. Not if you're following God's laws. This attitude that's mentioned here, who deceives the whole world, why even through this, to come out of Mystery Babylon, tells to his own saints, come out, don't be sucked into the system. Know those deceptions. Who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verses that again remind us of Satan's deception. We can overcome Satan now. Verses that are reminded in verse 11. We've gone through whole sermons on them in the past for the sake of time we won't today. But good ones to be refreshed on. Do you know how to disprove those false things that come in? Someone misquotes a verse. Your first thought is, what's the verse? Where's it at, first of all? Usually they'll, well, I, uh, that's the verse. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. It's Matthew 18. You can find it later, the wherever two or three are gathered together, dig into it. Can you disprove it? Do you know what the context is actually talking about? Those verses, again, that we have to, again, dig into God's word. Never underestimate Satan and his deceptions. We look, look, we look forward to this day when he will be removed. I have to wonder, what will that be like? You think about all the devastation that occurs from the seven trumps, that day of wrath of the Lord, and you almost wonder, is it kind of like a, the dust settling? It's not like trumpets and atonement back-to-back. -back. Is there the dust settling? 
letting people kind of see, wow, this is what Satan's world really is. And then they see Satan being dragged and thrown into the pit. Wow, well, maybe that wasn't the Christ we should have been looking to. And then love, mercy, faith, the, the true things of God being taught. Here's God's ways. And there's blessings for following God's ways. And then, wow, what a difference. This is the world I want. We think of those deceptions of Satan in this third reason. We are reminded of Satan's future. and We long for Satan's future. These are the fourth of these, and it is a quick one. We'll get through this. I only have ten verses. No, I'm joking, joking. Now, we are to be at one with God. I heard already quite a bit in the sermonette about this. Reminder, we are to be at one with God. It's all in the name. At one meant atonement. As we fast today, we are reminded we are human. We are reminded that we are desperately needing God in our life. We have to have him. We are to be humbly walking with God. We looked at two days ago and all that encompasses that in Micah 6 verse 8. Especially when we think of this spiritual warfare that we are in. We need God. We need his armor. We need to be on his side because we have no chance without God. We are to be at one with God. Turn over to 1 Peter 5. One other place, two other places after this quickly. 1 Peter 5. I referenced this two, two days ago. And I looked for water again, sorry. 1 Peter 5. This humility that must be there. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves. When you really think about it, that's the key. We need to humble ourselves. What the Day of Atonement is. We do not want God to humble us. Very different situation. We go through immense trials saying, oh, I need to wake up. God's like, yes, you need to wake up. He will humble us if we need it and we're not listening. We, on the better path, are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It will take place. That seventh trump will be here. He will exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You see more of this picture of Satan as this lion. I was just reading last night, uh, getting into Proverbs. Uh, Today is the 28th, so Proverbs 28, uh, verse 1, you think of, uh, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as lion. Why? Because you're looking to God. God's where the true righteousness comes from. The righteous are bold as a lion. We see Satan trying to kill and devour us. We have to be close to God. We have to humble ourselves Verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in this world. But may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. To him, again, going to the Father. I often find after the Day of Atonement that a lot of this perfect, establish, settle, so many trials that hit, especially before. And I know some that are still not quite sure if they'll be able to make it to the feast because of health difficulties or being in the hospital. All I can do is keep praying, keep praying and asking God, please help them to be able to be there. I know they want to be there, 
And I often see after atonement, so much of that same symbolism, God saying, all right, Satan, you're done with your trials right now. You're locked away. Let my people rejoice at my festival. And so much of this day and what it pictures. We cannot do this without God. It is humbling when we really realize it. We cannot do this without God. Turn finally back to Hebrews, two more quick places. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we see those times of need in our life, we need God. We've got to keep turning back, come boldly to that throne of grace, not with arrogance, but knowing our high priest, we can come into that holy of holies. That picture of what this day also reminds us. We are to be at one with God. One other place here in Hebrews 10. I kept finding so many places in Hebrews, and I probably do it every year, but but again, just encapsulate all that this day pictures. Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And this boldness also references confidence. Confidence may be a better one. Boldness kind of sounds arrogant. Nothing wrong with the boldness. But this confidence to enter, it's not because of anything we did. It's because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we can enter in through that blood. To enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. I've gone through a whole sermon on these verses alone. I love these three, let us. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. It comes back to that sprinkled, that sprinkling of blood. Hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. These verses just of tremendous encouragement. This keeps reminding us what we are to keep at, to not give up, to keep enduring to the end. We see these four reasons for the Day of Atonement. God instructs us to be here. It reminds us of our perfect high priest. We are reminded of Satan's future. And we are to be at one with God. We long for this day to be fulfilled. We can rejoice knowing that the Day of Atonement pictures a time when Satan the devil, the ruler of this world, along with his demons, will be locked up. And being at one with God, a time where mankind will come in to learn to be at one with God, to learn his ways. How beautiful a future we long for. That being at one with God is what we need to make Satan flee from us now. Stay close to God at one. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the atonement and Feast of Tabernacles last great day. Can hardly wait to hear how everyone had a wonderful time when you get back.